So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back here at the stand of Continental, and I warmly welcome you to our Continental Industrial Summit. So, uh, I hope you're ready for our next uh, talk, our next uh, presentation. It is the fifth talk of today, but to be honest, it's not only a talk, it's, it's a mix. Yeah, We have a presentation and we have a talk. So we start now with the presentation and I'm very happy to welcome now here on stage one of the world's leading futurists. He is a thought leader on the future of work, energy, mobility and artificial intelligence and he is the founder and chief futurist of the Future Matters AG. Do, do we say AG or AG? AG. AG. <laughs> we do it in the German style. Okay, AG in Zürich. Uh, this firm has helped more than 800 companies develop their future strategies and business models. So I'm very excited now um, about what he will tell us in his speech. So ladies and gentlemen, please give it up. Put your hands together for Lars Thompson. Thank you. <laughs> well, good afternoon. I think that uh, the Hannover Messe is always a good um, playground to think about the future and what I want to do with you today is to look ahead into the next 10 years. Actually, my talk will be about the next decade, the 20s of this century, not the 20s and the 19th or the 20th century, but what will happen over the course of the next 520 weeks. Now, the funny thing is, when we think about the future, we discover one thing. Most people underestimate what you can do in, let's say, 10 years, and they overestimate what can be done in one year. We often feel that when we are sitting down at New Year's Eve and making our good, um, uh, writing down our ideas what we want to change in the next year or so, and uh, come January or February, we give up most of those good um, um, uh, things that we wanted to do. But just think about um, how fast our world is changing at the moment. Um, it was about 600 weeks ago when the iPhone was presented in San Francisco by Steve Jobs. Now, 600 Mondays like today uh, is not a really long time, and that was iPhone 1. Now, iPhone 1 didn't even have a front camera because we haven't invented the term selfie at that moment because we had <laughs> digital cameras, but we never thought that we would hold a, a, a device up to our face and make a photo of ourselves and our friends. We had basically no apps, no social media, there was no Twitter, no WhatsApp, um, not too many apps. Um, actually, the internet wasn't capable of providing enough bandwidth to have live video or something like Snapchat over uh, the internet. But when um, Steve Jobs, the former CEO of Apple, was asked if this device would mark a tipping point in the way that we are using the mobile internet. He answered with a very famous quote. He said, you know, if a trend becomes obvious, you're too late. And that is so true in our times where we have so much innovation going on with almost every day that we hear about something new, we cannot really afford to not to think about the future and wait until it's there and then run after it. So what I want to do today is a little bit thought-provoking, talking about the disruptions or disruptive technologies uh, that will face us in the next 500 or 600 weeks, and that is until 2029. Now, predicting the future isn't that hard. Oftentimes, people think, you know, nobody knows what the future will bring. And I would say, well, if we are using our creativity, if we are using what we have left in our brains and fantasy and the ability to think about something that doesn't exist today, we are able to make projections to the future when we understand the basic dynamics and the physics of a systems, system that we are looking at. And I often describe looking into the future by making popcorn. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever made popcorn in, their, in your life. Uh, and I know today we can have m microwave popcorn where we put it in, you know, in, a, in a paper bag into the microwave and it pops after a few minutes. But the traditional way of making popcorn is taking a pot, 
filling about half a finger width of uh, half a centimeter of uh, heat resistant oil into the pot, taking one hand of popcorn kernels, throw it in the pot, and then apply some heat. Now, the funny thing is, if you take 10 people here from uh, the fair, and you would stand them next to the pot and say, make a prediction, how long does it take until the popcorn pops? You will see that most people will just do guessing, and very few are able to um, use logic or physics or biology or you know, some sort of um, um, uh, mathematical method to uh, predict the future. Now, when you apply the heat, the heat the, the, you see basically one trend that is very visible. The, hot, the, the pot is getting hotter. So the temperature is rising, and um, after about 20 seconds, the first people say, OK, any second now, any second now, don't go away, don't go away. I, I, think, I, I think I heard something. But it takes longer than 20 seconds. That was a wrong prediction. 20 seconds, no popcorn. Actually, it takes longer. It takes 60 seconds. 90 seconds go through, no popcorn at that stage. And after about 90 seconds, you will hear those who doubt that it will ever happen. After 90 seconds, many people will say, you know, we've waited so long, I don't think it's going to happen. And they walk away. But after about two minutes, we have reached a threshold at which the first popcorn pops. Now, the funny thing is, you don't have to guess anymore, because since this breakthrough innovation, this tipping point with the iPhone or with the smartphone, we are able to, use inf to, to access information that gives us all the information we need to make a good prediction. Because if you Google popcorn while you're standing, staring at the pot, you see that popcorn pops at about 180 degrees Celsius. And if you know, want to know why popcorn pops, basically the heat goes into the kernel. In the middle of the kernel, there's a little bit of water to supply the seed with enough water to grow. And this water actually starts to boil at some point and, 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 and creates a lot of steam, a lot of pressure inside the kernel. And that happens at all kernels at the same time. So when the first popcorn pops, everybody is kind of excited about it. But does it take another 90 seconds before the second popcorn pops? No, it goes pop, 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 pop. And within a few seconds, you see an exponential growth of popcorn popping. So basically, when we're looking at the future, we basically have to look at two trends. One linear trend, or incremental innovation. The pot gets hotter and hotter. And then we have an exponential trend where you see we have no popcorn at all, and then it grows exponentially. And most of, disrupt most of the disruptive innovations in our times have that popcorn scheme. So let's look at uh, um, of, um, of the, uh, the, the trends that we can see in the future. One thing, when we are looking at breakthroughs, Oftentimes, we are lacking the creativity to think how a world would look like if we are using a totally different approach. So, example, if you're looking at electric mobility, I know that many people doubt that if electric mobility will ever come, when it will come, but you know, there's a certain kind of logic to it. Actually, actually when we're looking at transport solutions, for example, we are looking at the point at which the batteries are so inexpensive that they actually become cheaper than building a diesel-powered truck. And especially in the transport or the logistics industry, we will see a very hard tipping point at which not the environmental specialist will say we need electric trucks, but the controller will say there's a certain point at which an electric propulsion system will be cheaper to operate and to buy than a diesel truck. So let's get into the tipping points that we are facing for the next um, decade. First is artificial intelligence. Now, when we are talking about that, I often refer to this trend as the end of stupidity. And to be honest, if we are looking at the way how we are interacting with computers and with machines today, it is still like the Stone Age. Because we have a, most of the machines that we are buying, whether they are computers or uh, any machines that we buy, we have a manual that we have to understand how this machine works. Now, this machine is designed to do certain tasks, but normally 
those machines cannot learn. So they are staying at the level that you bought it with, and you have to learn how the machine works. Now, artificial intelligence is turning this upside down. It's basically a very big major breakthrough or tipping point at which we can expect machines to learn, to get better over time, not only through software updates, but actually by interacting with uh, human beings. And I just want to give you some very few examples of how this will look like in the next 10 years. Cars will learn how to drive and to drive better than you because of the kilometers they're making by watching people drive. And at some point, we have a tipping point at which autonomous vehicles will be able to drive much safer than vehicles driven by a human driver. Um, that is a very hard tipping point. Now, in work, we will have, starting in about 200 weeks from now and four years from now, most of you will stop working with email or with, um, um, you know, uh, trying to understand what is written on an, in an email on a screen and type with your fingers, but you actually will, will start talking to your computer like, you have an, uh, like, like if you were having a uh, personal assistant. So in the year 2023, most of us, while driving back from work, you will have a personal assistant with you all the time that you can go through your day, and the personal assistant, which is an artificial intelligence system, will actually tell you what you know, people wanted from you today, if, if they can help you with answering these emails, writing them for, for you, will give you suggestions. Actually, this system will also learn with you and will make you, ab will make you able to, be, or to get better every day. Artificial intelligence will transform the way that we work in the next, cent in the next decade so much that when we look back in the year 2029 on how we worked in 2019, it will be just as unimaginable like our children um, cannot imagine a, a life without a smartphone uh, in their lives. Now, this will also transform the industry, and automation will, um, will come to a next level. Actually, this year, in 2019, the first five factories are opening where you can have a full-fledged operation working with the lights out. You don't need humans in that production system anymore. Now, that is a far-off vision, but more and more we will have autonomy in, um, in uh, production. Local production, that means that we are bringing back production systems to, to highly industrialized um, uh, countries like Germany, is most likely to occur within the next 10 years. So we are unlikely to, to um, outsource certain production facilities to China or to other countries, but it's most, most likely that more production will become local again than it, uh, when, it, uh, when we are coming to production systems. Now, when we are talking about Industry 4.0, you see some robots that we are well aware of, some KUKA robots in this uh, place. They are mounted to the ground. They are able to help companies to mass produce um, cars, for example, like on this picture. But the next generation of robotics will look totally different. And starting in about 150 weeks from now, in three years from now, we will see a new generation of robotics coming to our world. Hello. And this generation of robotics will not be mounted to the floor. It will not be caged, where people cannot go near those robots. Those robots will interact with us on a daily basis. We call them service robotics. Now, service robotics will actually find us anywhere where we are living, and they will come in very different shapes and sizes in forms uh, that we have probably never imagined. Um, they will um, go into agriculture because they have sensors and cameras that have pattern recognition. They can basically do the same things or same tasks like humans can do with their eyes and their hands. We will have autonomous vehicles that will be able to pick up um, uh, persons wherever they uh, want to be. And we will not only have you know, robots that will deliver something to your door, but also we will have humanoid robots. Now, this will take a little bit longer, but we are expecting one very interesting tipping point. In about 300 weeks from now, 
300 weeks is six years, so that's 2025. On the Hannover uh, Industrial Fair, you will see at least five companies that will present um, humanoid robots. Humanoid robots look like humans. Actually, they have mostly they have two legs, two arms, four fingers, and a thumb, and they have the same degree of um, movements that, that humans have. And they will cost um, about twenty thousand dollars a unit. Now, this is a real tipping point because we believe that the market for service robotics will grow to the size of the car industry worldwide by the year 2030. And the reason behind that is pretty obvious. Now, mobility will become autonomous, a push of a button service, mobility as a service. And just imagine if you have children and they will be living in, let's say, uh, Frankfurt or Shanghai or uh, you know, Paris, Will they buy a car for 20,000 euros to put on the street when they can have the ability to have a car or a transportation service anytime they want by the push of a button? Or will they rather buy a humanoid robot that will help them clean their apartment, to uh, load and unload the dishwasher, to um, clean the, the, the bathrooms, to help them um, you know, walk the dog or whatever when it costs about the same? Now, we believe in 10 years from now, 2029, one f uh, uh, 25% of all, all households in Europe and also in Asia will have a household robot. And that is the tipping point at which this market will grow bigger than the automotive industry is today. Now, there's many things to invent. We need to invent artificial skin that covers these robots, that has, has the ability to sense temperature and pressure so that we can have about the same touch and feel for a robot than, than we have in uh, human beings. We will need new artificial muscles that uh, work differently than, than electric motors. But this market is going to be big, and if we are thinking about what we will see in 10 years from now on this fair, I think that we will see quite a lot of robotics um, going on. This will also enter um, the service industry. Um, those little robots that you see here are um, from Boston Dynamics. Um, they look like dogs, and the good thing is they can walk stairs, they can deliver parcels, and I would bet that by the year 2022, that is in three years from now, you will, for the first time, open the door of your apartment or your house and you will get a parcel delivery by DHL or UPS, not delivered by a human, by, but by one of these things. Now, in order to achieve innovation, it is very important that the structures of our companies adapt to the real structure of our societies today. And what you see here is we are basically moving into a networked society where people interact with each other, they share ideas, and that is the same for companies that, um, going forward, uh, will have to ensure that all the talents that are in a talent pool of a company will be able to interact and share um, their ideas and their innovation skills. We will have more individualized products, um, com companies that will not only mass produce, but produce individualized products using 3D printers, um, new additive manufacturing techniques that enable them to produce um, uh, products much more um, efficiently than today. When we are talking about megacities and the demand that, that pushes on there uh, um, um, onto new industries, there's some interesting things happening. Now, we already have 17 megacities at the moment, or metropolitan areas that consist of more than 30 million inhabitants. And to, in order to feed these people, to supply them with you know, greens and grains and salad and food, there is a major breakthrough coming in the middle of the next, uh, next decade, and that is vertical farming. Now, vertical farming promises to revolutionize our food production um, within the next 10 years. And the funny thing is, when you're looking at vertical farming, which are basically skyscrapers, that have their own little microclimate in them, you can grow about 
370 times as much on the same space than if you would put this just on the field under the open sky because you're using the water more efficiently, you don't need any um, uh, pesticides, uh, you can use solar energy to light these plants with LED power and, all, and, and even those machines will be constructed and they will be using you know, moving parts and probably even belts um, like Conti is providing in there. Um, we also see a new network developing the Internet of Things and also on this Internet of Things managing energy and payments where cryptocurrencies, payment and um, clearing will become more obvious. Now, second to last, energy. Within the next decade, we will see the tipping point at which we can produce a kilowatt hour worth of energy more efficiently and more cheaply by using renewable energy than using fossil fuels. Now, for the first time for the last 180 years, this is true because until now, it is in most cases more, more, uh, more um, price worthy to burn fossil fuels to produce electric energy or propulsion energy in an engine, this will change dramatically with the need for storage and intelligent energy systems going forward. In terms of transport, we are going not only on the second dimension, but we are going into the air and to, to the, the, the tunnels as well. Conti is working on these things like you know, automatic delivery platforms for goods and services. But we already see uh, 17 companies in the world who are working on flying taxis, autonomous drones, where you can get in and fly wherever you want to without having a, 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 a flying license. Now, in 10 years from now, on every roof of this fair, there will be a landing place for drones. And many of you will not use a taxi and sitting in traffic, but fly here because it will be just about the same price tunnels as well um, that uh, probably replace some of the air traffic that we have. But last but not least, and I'm ready for the discussion then, I think it is very important to think about how we will structure our company values and communities of common shared values in the future. There is a demographic change. We have an aging society and it's much harder today to find the right people to uh, work on all these innovative uh, ideas and, and possibilities and options that we have in the future. And the last tipping point that we see is, I don't think that we will have employers and employees in 10 years from now, but we will have brands that are so strong that people will join this brand to, you know, and say, I want to be part of their journey. I want to commit to, to, to their ideas, to their vision, to their goals, and they will join these companies because they, they offer quite a lot of opportunities for people who are talented and crazy enough to uh, think about the future. So that was my first small introduction. I can only say as a futurist, um, I, I'm often worried because when, when you switch on the television today, you often hear people talking about the future and they say, oh, oh, we hope this is not coming. Oh, 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 everything is going down. As a futurist, I can only say, there's never been a time where we had more opportunities in just one decade as in the decade to come. So see each other in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lars Thompson. And please uh, stay with us because as you just mentioned we want to have a discussion, a talk now here on stage talking about the future and when talking about future uh, someone uh, should join us because she is um, head of business development at, at Contitech. Uh, please welcome Svantje Oldorp. <laughs> you can clap your hands ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. So, nice to have you here. So, Svante, um, Lars mentioned several mega trends, mm -hmm. and um, one uh, of them is um, new materials and production processes. Uh, where do you see opportunities for um, Continental, and maybe uh, you have some current examples? Yes. So, um, what I find intriguing is that it's not just one trend you're hitting, but you're also 
meeting several trends at the same time. And on the one hand, we will certainly see future markets for revenues on our side. But on the other hand, we also see in our internal production processes plenty of opportunity. If I think about uh, the serial production that we have, we are very much looking already into automation. So pictures such as cobots are not uh, alien to us, but they are very much what we are looking to. Um, there will always be humans in our factories, but we do strategic workforce planning to be able to actually encounter that trend in a timely fashion and be cost competitive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when we talk about um, the uh, revenue side, uh, we definitely see trends towards lightweight construction. So even though we might be a rubber company, more and more we also um, face that trend towards plastic components, which means that we, at the same time that we do our traditional business, we're also looking at plastic competencies, because whenever you have materials and applications which need to be lightweight, be it in the automotive space or be it in the industrial space, especially in very rugged, um, rugged um, environments, um, you might want to substitute our existing products. Um, so there's plenty of opportunities, um, and at the moment I wouldn't say there's one over the other. The only thing that I can say is um, that we have that many opportunities that we cannot leverage them by ourselves, but effectively we are looking for partners to make that happen, because just ourselves is not going to make it happen. Mm. Okay, great. So, um, Lars, um, Continental, it's a huge and global uh, company. So, uh, why is it so important for Continental to be ready, of, ready for future trends and why should every company be aware of the so-called uh, tipping points? You know, um, if you're successful at what you're doing, you always tend to make incremental innovation. You, you're taking what you have, your existing portfolio, and trying to make it even better. And, you know, that's okay for many things, but Disruptive opportunities are basically, you know, taking a white sheet of paper and start to think about can you solve a problem in a totally different way than, you know, you started off in the, in, in the past. So I think it's important to have both, to build on what you have achieved in the past and to increment, you know, have incremental innovation uh, and, and to make it better but also to, uh, to give people the opportunity to come up with very wild new ideas for new problem solution. Now, most technology that we have in our world is a solution to a problem. Now, even if you have a car or an airplane or a, you know, a you know, cramping machine, it solves a problem. And oftentimes it helps if you are looking at the core of the problem, you know, what you really want to achieve. And I just want to give you an example. If, if we are looking back, you know, just imagine you were in 2029 and you told your children how we had mobility in 2019. And we said, you know, we are, we are sitting behind a wheel, sitting in traffic, we had to operate the clutch and the gas pedal and, you know, you know go a little bit further and then stop again and had to take care of everything ourselves. Uh, our children will say, you know, that's crazy, that's, that's, that's not good. And oftentimes, when you're talking to, for example, our car, manufacturer, car manufacturing companies, they say, well, it's the best we can do. It's, you know, that's, that's great. So oftentimes, we really have to think out of the box. And I think that Continental, right now, from, you know, from my understanding, is doing just that. It, it's, it's starting to, to think about problem solution, talking to their clients, probably even talking to people who are not clients yet, asking them, what, what, can, can we develop something together? And that is the way to get into markets that are not existing yet. So, for example, for vertical farming, as I talked about, we, we, we think that vertical farming has the potential to, to supply um, a quarter of all food produced in the world in 10 years from now. Right now, there's basically nothing. But you really have to go out to those startup entrepreneurs and ask them, okay, how can we help you build you know, one of these plants using our technology and expertise and engineering skills, and then you can be part of a market that might be even bigger than the markets that you're in today. Um, just tell us, how do you identify uh, tipping points, and uh, how long does it take to, um, yeah, that the new technology um, is accepted by the wider economy and society? Well, oftentimes people tend to, in, in, in the first encounter with a new technology, people tend to say, I don't need that. Actually, I, I, was, I made the same mistake when the, the iPhone came out. 
I first doubted that you know, people would really you know, buy that in masses. But when you have it first time in your hand and you really see what a difference it makes and, and what you can use it for, um, you, you adapt quite well or quite, quite fast. And I think uh, with the adoption of tipping points, once people are um, confronted with a new technology or doing it for the same time, so if you, you, know, you probably think you don't need a flying drone, but if you, if, if you went from Hamburg to Hanover right on you know, to this hall, in about 15 minutes without standing in traffic and you did that for the first time, it will adopt pretty fast because you will tell 10 people about it or 20 people and say, it's no big deal, it's great. So I think that eventually innovation is always creating a better solution to a problem that we already have and it has to be better than the problem solution that is existing today and then it will be adopted. Svante, you are um, the head of business development. How important are these uh, tipping points for developing um, new business uh, models? And how fast can you react to these? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so they are super important because it might not just be that you see a new market emerging, but you might also see that an old market is completely gone within just a couple of years. And there's plenty of examples where industry just collapsed because of new possibilities. So it's very important for us to stay ahead of the game. However, um, it will not be possible uh, in the traditional ways. Um, usually industrial companies do investment cases based on statistics. <laughs> and if all of a sudden you have a market where the size is zero and you need to convince your CEO, there's going to be 500 million, there's going to be 1 million of new revenues and you show zero market today, that's pretty difficult to argue. So all of a sudden you need to get much more into qualitative discussion on the why these things emerge and you need to apply different types of market intelligence. Um, so the way that um, Lars just described it is uh, we're getting more and more to network organization and we need to be much smarter about the way that we identify those trends. Um, and effectively, one of the things that we try to implement in our organization is a way more digital way of sharing this information. Um, I just returned from the States where our um, US sales team uses Salesforce as our customer relationship tool, customer relationship management tool. However, there's also a function in there called Chatter. This is a wonderful um, possibility to gather information from the field where salesmen would have encountered some sort of use case and the more dense the information becomes, the more often you see this information coming up on that channel, you can say there's some sort of weak signals from the market. Um, and I just went to a conference about three, three weeks ago uh, where I met a university professor from uh, Liechtenstein uh, who actually has a mathematical model uh, where he's not looking at the density of patterns anymore, but effectively he's looking at publications so he's screening with some machine the internet for information that's coming up on certain subjects, which for us in the traditional way of doing market intelligence, um, by looking into very defined segments we're already aware of, all of a sudden outlines to us by some sort of algorithms, there's going to be clusters of information. And these publications somewhat precedes patterns coming up on the market. So it's super important to be mindful when these weak, weak signals uh, start coming up because on the one hand it might be the new markets such as vertical farming, on the other hand it could also be that one of our traditional markets is going to become obsolete. So at the end I would like to hear your personal opinion. Um, we're talking about megatrends, so I want to hear now a megatrend uh, from you. So what is the next uh, megatrend um, that has the greatest potential for society and especially continental. Who want to be the first? It's, it's you, Lars. <laughs> oh, I, I think there's more than one. Um, uh, uh, well, most of the industries that we are seeing, whether it's trade or logistics or energy or automotive or, you know, all these industries undergo th some changes, oftentimes disruptive changes in their business model and in the way that they're producing things. So I think there's quite a lot of opportunity for a company like uh, Continental to actually help them design solutions, probably be even part, you know, in, you know like an in, in, internal part of a 
of an industry that are not on the client portfolio uh, right now. Um, I th personally think you know the, the three biggest trends that we see for next next decade is robotics. You need artificial skin, artificial muscles. You need quite a lot of um, motors and, and mechanical things that move. I mean, it's it's perfectly fitted for 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 Continental to to go into these different areas. The second one is basically food production. I, I think the way that we are producing f food for 7.5 billion people is not sustainable and not good. I mean, it's, it's, if you look into it, it's, it's very inefficient. It's, it's, it's producing so much methane. Uh, so there's a lot to do. And the third one is energy. I think that um, you know, climate change is real. It's, it's one of the biggest threats that humankind ever had. Actually, we are, we are far beyond the worst case scenarios from 1990 in, in, mo in most cases. And we really have to get serious about energy and how we incorporate more and more renewable energy, storage, intelligent energy systems. So these are the three basic uh, or the most important things that I would look into. And I would have interdisciplinary teams that have the ability to really you know, use their creativity, their curiosity. When I'm going, you know, I spend about 30% of my time as a futurist just traveling the world, talking to people who are working on the future. And there's so much to learn. Uh, it's not a waste of time. It's, it's actually one of the most productive times when I'm traveling to people who are actually working on great things. And, and uh, you come back with, with you know, inspiration and ideas and lots of business opportunities. So that, that's my suggestion to Conti. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So three <laughs> mega trends were already <laughs> mentioned. Is there <laughs> no, it's, any it, trend left? It's, it's actually interesting how uh, the opinions coincide. I, I would absolutely agree that on the uh, processing side, uh, both robotics and artificial intelligence are going to be key. Effectively, um, if I think about some of the innovative stuff we're already doing, I mean, we have something like an artifici artificial intelligence assistant already starting to work on our sales processes today. All right. um, and that's the stuff that we definitely uh, need to tackle because they're going to be driving costs uh, down like hell. Um, the other thing um, that um, I would like to remind myself again and again, it's not just about that data s uh, society, but in the end, um, Continental and particularly the division Contitech is all about materials. Um, this is where we have our core competencies. So I think new material trends um, to cater um, both for construction as well as transportation. I mean, look at micromobility. That's going to be a gigantic, gigantic market in itself. We definitely want to capture those material trends. Uh, and last but not least, um, also sharing your opinion about um, the food industry uh, with the population growth that we see, uh, we definitely um, need to take care that we capture something like vertical farming in a timely fashion because if in the horizontal space, um, you are not going to be able to cover the, the needs for the population And you have anymore. to pray for sun and, and, exactly. and rain and you know, oftentimes it doesn't work out that well. Yeah. Mm. So I think food production, both for vertical farming or also artificial food, which we're going to see upcoming on the horizon, uh, we definitely need to capture those trends, yes. So I'm absolutely sure we could have spent hours here talking about the future, <laughs> but our time is limited. So uh, now we are at the end. Thank you both very much for being here. I think we see each other again tomorrow. tomorrow. Yes. Perfect. So uh, thank you one more time. And uh, this is your round of applause for being here on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Put your hands together. Yeah.